Well, welcome back to the Alexander Schmidt Podcast, episode 62 now, but the first of our lectures on Harry Potter. So as promised earlier on in the year, I said that I would do lectures on at least the first Harry Potter book this summer, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And so I'm going to be doing some of those in sort of an academic and sort of an amplificatory way, like uh, Carl Jung did with his patients and exploring images and symbols that go alongside the images and symbols that we see in the story, as well as analyzing the story itself. And also as a compliment to this, or perhaps this is a compliment to that, um, two other teachers, two fellow teachers from two different states, Miss Sarah Miller and Mr. Wesley Shantz, Mr. Wesley Shantz of currently of Spokane, um, Washington and Miss Sarah Miller currently of the DC area, but soon to be back in, I believe, Seattle, Washington, accepting a new teaching position, will be talking with me through um, Harry Potter and um, the Sorcerer's Stone. And there are 17 chapters, and as of now, it looks like we're going to go around a chapter at a time if we can contain ourselves. And so today, I thought, as sort of a preamble to that, I might analyze the American cover of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which is actually a very big part of um, my experience reading the texts. Um, when I first started reading them, I read not only the, the English versions, but the American versions. And the English versions of the covers are often different from the American versions. And in fact, the English versions often have an adult version, which has the exact same text as the children's version, but has a different cover from the um, from the children's version. Um, but here I'll talk about the American cover, which is done in that beautiful pastel style. On the front, there in gold at the top is Harry Potter with a lightning coming down at the long end of the P. Um, Harry himself is a young boy with poorly fitting clothes, looking very regular except for his cape and his lightning scar on a, and slightly ajar above, a, a magical broomstick going through a gate trying to catch what we'll soon find out is called the Golden Snitch, or by Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, the Round Chaos, which he learned about from the alchemist in Jung. We see a faceless unicorn running towards what we'll soon come to know as the Forbidden Forest, or symbol of the unconscious or unknown territory. And on the right of the scene, we see next to a right pillar, a second twin pillar, we see um, a castle, which is Hogwarts, a school with a three-headed dog modeled after Cerberus, but here called Fluffy in the bowels of it. And in fact, the, in the actual story itself, the three-headed dog will be near the top on the third floor, but this image seeming to get the symbolism even better places the, the, the three-headed dog where you would expect it, like where it would be in Hades, beneath the castle at the the gate to the unconscious and so let's talk about a couple issues very quickly the first one is this for the first harry potter in the english edition it was called harry potter and the philosopher's stone it was called the philosopher's stone because in medieval alchemy the idea was that a philosopher's stone would enable one to if one could produce a philosopher's stone the philosopher's stone could produce the aqua vitae which would be the water of life which would make one eternal like nicholas flamel claimed to have done in this text itself the second thing that a philosopher's stone allowed one to do is to turn crude matter into gold. The reason why, even though the Philosopher's Stone obviously does work given the fact that Voldemort in this text wishes to get the Philosopher's Stone so that he can uh, achieve immortality in a more substantial way than drinking unicorn blood or uh, or constructing horcruxes, uh, the idea is that if he can access this Philosopher's Stone, he, like Nicholas Flamel, can be immortal. And so the Sorcerer's Stone, as it's called in the American version, is still simply a Philosopher's Stone. Um, but the sad reason why um, the publishers did not call the Sorcerer's Stone the Philosopher's Stone for Americans is that we were considered too uneducated to understand the reference. And so this podcast will help us to fix that. Let's now talk about Harry Potter's name itself. So Harry Potter, what does it mean to be a potter? Well, it means to be somebody who plants plants or places plants within conscribed cultural limits, pots, 
placing nature within that which is made by society or made by the mind and um, placing nature within that pot in order to grow in a certain fashion. And so this potter is like a sower or a planter or a cultivator of nature. He is something of an admixture but or that which develops a relationship that is uh, uh, salubrious between both nature and and culture and so we'll have to understand what a person within a magical world um um learning about his own innermost nature has to offer to that uh question what does it mean to be a potter what does it mean to be harry potter and so he's a limiter or potter of plants and uh sim similar to sort of any hero or like jesus or heracles or a number of others, he will himself experience uh, danger at his birth. And we'll talk about that more in the next lecture, which potentially I'll, I'll rail off uh, today because I'm so excited. All right, so let's get on to the cover itself. So the golden text at the top, uh, and there's the lightning aspect to the P. And so the foundation of the character is something divine, because lightning is, of course, that which signifies the will of Zeus or Jove, um, lightning, there will be a lightning bolt indicating uh, being chosen as sort of a divine child by Harry on his forehead. And gold, of course, the color of the sun, the color of the golden snitch, which guides attention, is the color of divinity. And so something, there is, there will be a divine mark on this Harry Potter. He is the divine child. He is the one that the boy who lived, who did the impossible, that which none other could do. And so he's a symbol of the archetype of the divine child or the hero to come. And so he takes on several different aspects of both Heracles and Jesus here. So let's keep moving forward. So in this cover, he's also seen to be passing through an archway about to catch a golden snitch. And so this is a this is like a more in, the image reminds me very much of like a more enthusiastic version of the creation of man where um, there's there the I believe it's by Michelangelo it uh, there's God who looks like he's in sort of a brain and is pointing his finger out and Adam is sort of lazily pointing his finger out and I think the idea is that they need to touch or that they are reflections of each other but in this case we see that Harry is himself choosing to go through this archway. Um, and so what does this archway indicate? Well, in the text of this story, he will go from the world of the muggles, of the normal, the mundane, to the world of magic. Sort of like Maslow's distinction between the D world and the B world, or the world of deficiencies, which is, you know, everybody in their normal lives being their sort of non-ideal forms, um, using the restroom, eating, getting sick, dying. None of these are ideal aspects of existence. But then also there's the being aspect of one's existence, which is where the moments in which one exists reflect divine or eternal moments, where one reflects the archetype which one embodies. Like say if you hit a home run as a baseball player and that wins the game, you in that moment are identified with the hero and you have an, a, an accompanying experience which Maslow would describe as a peak experience. And so here we see a peak experience of sort of transformation or initiation. Uh, Harry is accepting his divine or creative or imaginal or magical nature. He is going through the entryway and catching the golden snitch. And so he is following his attention or that which interests him. And that is going to bring him into a new world by allowing him to access new information about not only that world but about himself because any obstacle the purpose of an obstacle at least for a human um like like getting through a maze or a video game is to measure oneself against it in sort of a pythagorean way and so down to his left is a faceless unicorn running towards the dark forest and so a unicorn at least according to carl jung and his alchemical studies is a symbol of individuation. It has a single horn that guides it and leads it um, towards its own destiny and is, of course, uh, a figure of the imagination and thus an ideal towards which one strives. Something interesting in the Harry Potter universe 
is that unicorns do inhabit these dark forests. They have silver blood, and if one drinks their blood after killing them, they are both blessed and cursed, blessed with eternal life, but cursed to live a life not worth living because of having killed a pure creature. And so the unicorn also seems to be something sort of sim re resembling a divine uh, sacrificial Jesus figure in that it can give... It is so pure a figure that in killing it, one damns one's self. Um, uh, differences, of course, in that figure being that the unicorn does not die for the sins of mankind, um, but rather in being killed by a man, curses that man, and perhaps rightly so. And so on the other side of the cover, which is happening at twilight, and one can just now begin to see stars coming out then, and so it is a magical or transitional time. And uh, in fact, Harry is himself not only between air and earth, but between forest and castle going over a plain here. And so much about this cover indicates the transitional nature of being 11 or 12, starting to go through puberty, entering uh, secondary school, um, becoming more than just a child, but taking on one's aspects as an adult, male or female. And so, why is Hogwarts, the castle, a symbol very similar to, say, the Disney castle? Uh, why is it inhabited by a three-headed dog at the bottom? Well, think about it. What does one go to school to learn? Simply, does one go to a school to be protected like in a fortress? No. And in fact, though Hogwarts is very much well protected by walls, each year there will be certain threats that come both from within and without. And that's precisely the idea. When one goes to a school, one doesn't go to make a home that will be perfectly protected. One goes to learn about the traditions of the past as well as about oneself and one's inner nature, thus learning about the nature of humans and one's own nature as a human. And so in going to learn, in going to Hogwarts, a place that is steeped and rooted in tradition, one learns not only about the good aspects of humans, and in this case, witches and wizards, but also the negative, evil, dark ones. And in learning about the dark aspects of history, one does not learn about that which once was and no longer is, but one learns about oneself as well. And so the idea that there is a Cerberus or guardian to the underworld lurking beneath Hogwarts is precisely right. And in fact, in the second movie with a basilisk, very similar uh, image of that which is threatening and lies beneath, lying beneath Hogwarts is also an excellent image. Because the idea is that you not only gain the safety and stability and structure of culture by going to school, but you also see the darkness that exists within man through and thus within yourself through seeing the actions that have been propagated throughout time. And so you learn not only the evil things that have happened, like, say, Nazism and various communisms that led to mass murders, like in China and in the Soviet Union, Soviet Union estimates being 20 to 50 million, as reported um, in the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn, and um, upwards of almost a uh, hundred million during the Cultural Revolution of China. Um, and so, and we'll see, um, we will see with the, the coming up of Dolores Umbridge, a certain collectivist tendency take root in the Harry Potter world. So those, those illusions will not find themselves irrelevant. And so, Ultimately, at the bottom of the school, like at the bottom of one's own soul, one, find, one will find Voldemort in this, this text, who is essentially the Luciferian figure who is himself disembodied but has found himself embodied in the head or the mind of a Defense Against the Dark Arts professor who wears a turban indicating that he has been to exotic places and has exotic thoughts, and in the wasteland of his mind, dark thoughts and a dark being has taken root. And so, what we will ultimately learn at the end of this book, and which we're already deducing just from the cover, is that at the bottom of the soul of each person, which is the purpose of any education, is the devil. And so one must recognize that Voldemort, or he who must not be named, exists not only in a disembodied form or in an 
embedded form within Professor Quarrel or outside in the Forgotten Forest, but in fact, the seeds of Voldemort exist within all of us. And so we can be both good and evil. And that is why free agency or free choice is the most important possible thing, because whenever we choose good, we're not doing evil, and that's a very important thing. And so also, evil does not just exist in some being called Voldemort, or perhaps you could call it Lucifer, but exists within all beings capable of choice, which would make us all very, very, very responsible for not only ourselves, but the state of the world itself. Um, so, last thing is that though the forest is a clear symbol of anomaly and exotic place, there will be centaurs, giants, giant um, uh, tarantulas or spiders out there. Um, there will even be a terrible abduction scene, which will actually be sort of a wonderful abduction scene, which, like the spiders, will come in later texts. And so anomalous events will happen out in the Forbidden Forest, and in this scary, dark forest. But to be kept in mind, anomalous events will take place within the castle itself as well, suggesting that no, long, no matter how high our walls are, no matter how much we try to keep nature and that which is strange, exotic, different, and potentially threatening out, that the greatest threats come not only from without, but also from within. And so... I believe I've said my piece on this cover at this moment, and this has been our first lecture on Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I suppose I could add one last note, that of course the text on the side is gold, and it's set on purple, and those are the two colors of divinity. And we'll soon see those colors in Albus Dumbledore's gown, which will be purple, and his half-moon spectacles, which I believe they may be silver. Um, but it would be good if they were gold, because here we see that this is a royal book, uh, royal in that it emphasizes the divine hero, who is the child of a god in some way or another. And we'll have to talk about in the next lecture, and when I talk to Miss Sarah Miller and Mr. West Chance, how it is that Harry Potter could be the child of a god, or a child of archetypal parents, archetypal parents who he will never know because he will be a, an orphan. And to what extent any orphan has archetypal or divine parents, which is a motif taken up by the bastards, technically speaking, in the Game of Thrones series, being named either sand or snow or flowers, depending on where one comes from. All right, well, this has been Alexander Schmidt, and this has been my first lecture on Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Please tune in and enjoy. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.